Oh, and we have so many wonderful people to present. That's great. Um, Nico, do you wanna maybe, actually first, first let's do introductions. Introductions are important. Um, so let's do a round of that and then Nico, maybe you can take it away and, and talk a little bit about the work you've been doing. Um, so I'm Molly, I'm the captain of the Local Offline Collaboration Working Group, um, which is a working group in the wider IPFS project really about connecting the, the work that we're doing around decentralized applications with all of the amazing people who are thinking about how to make technology and the internet um, and software more accessible to people who want to collaborate locally, have maybe poor bandwidth or um, connectivity constraints, and um, spend a lot of time kind of shuttling between all of the working groups inside IPFS who are working on this and people in the external community and trying to um, document the, the challenges and pain points and get them so that they're improved upon in all of the various working groups. Um, so I'm your brainstorm buddy if there's anything that, you know, people, people see as uh, something that we can really make, make progress on from an engineering perspective. Um, I'm just going to kind of call on people based on how you happen to be arrayed on my Zoom screen. So hopefully that sounds good. Chris, you are the person next to me. You want to give an intro? Sure. Um, I'm here just out of personal interest in the project. I've always been working on offline stuff. Uh, if you don't know me, I guess uh, one of the things I did back in the day was Apache CouchDB and found Couchbase. And so for me, a lot of the, and build the Couchbase mobile project. And so for me, a lot of the brainstorming has always been around use cases, like what happens when a handful of people are standing up a new network and they're fully disconnected. So how do you support those use cases? So mostly I'm just here to, to watch and I've got to drop early. I've got to get to another meeting. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you for attending and excited to, if, if there's anything you, cool you want to demo, um, feel free to slot yourself in early so that we get you before you drop off. Um, awesome. Jonathan, you are below me. Yeah. So um, I've been building like this network of um, official hardware for disaster recovery, starting with um, this Mozilla grant project. And now um, I'm, yeah, I'm basically working with a couple of different clients on one for stuff. So, uh, one of it is using Laura for, um, for kind of a similar setup. And the other is, um, actually we're talking with protocol, uh, for museums to be able to share data between, um, themselves and artists and stuff like that. And that's kind of in the works. Awesome. Good to good to see you again, as always. Nico, you are right below me. Do you want to go next? Sure. Uh, hi. Thank you, Molly, for inviting me. Uh, uh, I am Nicholas. I am part of... Uh, right now, I uh, actually changed hacks. So now I am part of APC, the Association for, for Progressive Communications. Um, APC has been working for 30 years in bringing affordable access to the global south and um, it has been also part of the of the internet foundation uh, in many uh, global south countries so and i'm part of this process of uh, apc trying to get more into uh, helping communities uh, achieve this Getting Connected by Themselves approach uh, that Alter Money has been having for many years. Uh, my previous, actually my, like my permanent hat is Alter Mundi. It's an organization that promotes um, do-it-yourself do approach to uh, infrastructure deployment, uh, in particular internet infrastructure. And the purpose of this is actually not about infrastructure, but about community organization, what we think is by doing this kick-free approach to networks, people can get together. And uh, by getting together, they will accomplish networks and many, many other things. Um, so it's kind of a social hack using technology in between. I will share a little bit more later. Awesome, thank you so much. Dominic, you're diagonally down for me. Hey everyone, um, my name is Dominic. I work for Protocol Labs on one of Molly's teams. Um, so 
I like to sit in on, in on these things and hear what people are doing and specifically listen in for like pain points and things like that and see if there's anything we can do to help alleviate some of that stuff. So yeah, I'm interested in hearing what everyone says. Phenomenal, thank you. Terry, do you wanna go next? Yeah, I'm impressed that you pointed, actually pointed at me on my screen too. Um, <clears throat> it's a very Brady bunch of us. Um, I'm Terry Chadborn. I, so I got into decentralized web because I was first involved with the offline first movement, which is focused on making stuff just work on crappy networks or non-existent networks, all of that. Um, and I heard about decentralized web while I was at offline camp, which is an event I've been planning for a few years, uh, focused on that offline first community. So I'll tell you more about that later, but I currently work at uh, I used to work for um, Cloudant, which was essentially CouchDB as a service hosted. And now I work for Protocol Labs, where I'm running a project called Proto School, um, which is sort of attempting to make it easy to get started with the decentralized web through tutorials. Awesome. Jim, do you, you're diagonally down from me. Okay. Uh, hi, I work at Protocol Labs. I'm working on a dynamic data and capabilities group, and my thing is PeerPad. So that should be the new version should be launching like really, really soon because we have it persisting to IPFS IPLD. That's really exciting. Next step for that one, I think beyond uh, the, probably the next experiment for it on deck is going to be making it work offline. So very interested in this stuff. So. Awesome. We used it in a meeting, I think last week, and it was fantastic. It worked perfectly. It was better than our previous note-taking tools, and it was all markdown friendly, and I can't wait for, for other people. We definitely did use the dev.peer.pad.net, so um, looking forward for that one being the canonical one. Dietrich, you are two down for me. Do you want to go? Hello. Nice to meet you, everybody. This is my first meeting uh, of this group and my first week at Protocol Labs. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I worked on various offline related projects at Mozilla for a long time before coming here and ran a few student projects around research that we did in places like uh, Brazil and Thailand and meeting people on the web meet needs for things like long commutes with limited connectivity or expensive connectivity. So I'm really interested to see what the group here is talking about. Awesome, excited to have you. Um, and finally, I'm gonna butcher this name, but Joropo, do you? Uh, uh, hello. Uh -huh. um, so uh, I'm a student in cybersecurity and uh, I'm, I've been interested by uh, EPFS while I was searching for how I can uh, um, uh, save bandwidth in uh, multiple, in, my school personally is for downloading uh, apps. And uh, the idea of uh, re-decentralizing the web is uh, actually <laughs> something that I found uh, quite uh, yeah, quite useful and maybe it will be the future, so I'm here for that. Awesome, excited to have you. If, if folks um, don't constantly follow our repo, there was a great kind of explanation um, from Joropa about the um, use case that uh, part of. I would, I'd love to hear more about that in this meeting as well. Uh, okay. Uh, would you right now or after? Um, we can add you to the agenda um, and uh, okay. you can go jump in first and then uh, talk about that in a little bit. All right, Nico, I believe you are our first agenda item. So do you want to maybe give a brief overview for people who are not familiar with kind of the research you've been doing and then maybe we can kind of pelt you with, with some questions about like kind of insights and, and learnings about the work you've been doing? Awesome, thank you, Molly. Uh, I think research is kind of a big word for me, at least I don't feel my, I don't call myself a researcher, but uh, I have been uh, working in community networks for two years and a half already uh, have had the, the opportunity to visit communities in all of the corners of the planet, uh, hearing about their needs and hearing about the, the, and helping them and working together with them to explore 
connecting themselves to to each other first and also to the internet and and that comment like that conversation happening in a very like uh, like this being connected or in, not connected or connected to what or who do we want to connect to and uh, all those uh, conversations uh, that are usually difficult to discuss so we met with uh, Matt uh, from what well, former IPFS uh, protocol labs and uh, he started hearing my stories and what I had to say and uh, he said okay let's we need to do something together, and I said yes, of course. Like peer-to-peer like, -peer technology should be aware. Should, from my point of view, uh, like, okay, hold on. So half of the planet is disconnected. I think that the, some a, a little a little bit of background is needed. So half of the planet has been connected. Thirty years have passed the, since the internet started, and the market as it is has been capable of connecting half of the planet. And it, we usually say that the, the part that has been connected has been the easy part. Like most of the people in, in urban cities, the people that is that has enough income to pay for connectivity to the, in, in an open market, and the people that every now and then can access any open hotspot that municipalities or governments can open. But it certainly doesn't get to everyone it, and it doesn't get to the rural places of your nearby city for sure i mean if you look around if you go 50 kilometers or 100 kilometers from where you live already into the rural areas the most the, the big there's a big chance that the people over there has a very crappy connection or no not connection at all and um, that happens basically because the market is not able to provide services in places where people that where investment is too high so the the, the capital expense the capex is too high or where people are not able to pay for the service where like where, where people's disposable income is too low for the market to be providing services uh, so basically the companies do the math and they say, well, I, I will not, I'm not interested in going to that market, so we will not provide the ser service. And the government's uh, strategies to provide service in those areas have been basically extending the market's capabilities as, uh, as far as they can. Uh, and it has worked this far. Half of the planet's population, 3 billion people are connected. But the three other billion people are not only the ones that are unconnected and have been unconnected 30 years ago and will probably be connected unconnected for the following 30 years. Uh, the speed of the, the, the market growth has dramatically decreased. So the capacity of the market to get to those places is really like, or probably will not get there. Uh, and this, uh, and the governments have no tool to approach to this problem. So, uh, what we have been working uh, from Altarmundi and now from APC and many other organizations like Rizomatica, like Zeleni, like uh, Mozilla has a program in relation to community networks, uh, Art Article 19, and many, many other organizations around Internet Society, of course, um, has been supporting communities that said, okay, market, if you don't want to get as far as where we are, it's fine. Just stay where you are we will provide ourselves with connectivity and how well deploying infrastructure like uh, uh, the way the operators do the way the companies do but by their own means with their own values in their own way with their own rules uh, and um, well this is happening all over the place I have some photos to share with you while we talk so I don't have a, a slideshow so you will have to bear with me while I walked through my, my photo albums, but uh, I will share my screen now so you can uh, see a little bit of uh, my journey. So, okay, you should be watching, looking at my screen. Uh, okay, so uh, let's start with this. Uh, yeah, so recently my hard drive, my backup hard drive, my only hard drive broke, so I had to recover, and some of the pictures are not there, but I will try to show some of them. 
So this is uh, in Mexico, Javiche. Uh, this uh, this is a uh, indigenous uh, university in the rural mountains of Oaxaca, Mexico, and um, the university was entitled by the local authorities to create infrastructure for them for themselves. And please stop me at any point if you have any questions about what you are seeing, and also. I am really bad at keeping track of time, so if uh, anyone can stop me, <laughs> just stop me. Um, I'll try and keep for you and try and, call. when we've hit about 20 minutes, I'll try and flag you down. Thank you. Uh, and we can carry on later if you want. I mean, after the hour, if you want to see more pictures or if you have more questions, just reach me. Uh, the idea would be to see how we can work. My, my purpose in relation to this is how can the needs of the unconnected uh, be uh, supported by peer-to-peer -peer technologies? And the ultimate goal, for at, at least, sorry, the opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer technologies, from my perspective, is to be able to rewrite the, the, the social dynamics of the internet from the unconnected on, because the unconnected are half of the world's population. It's difficult to change the behavior of those that are already connected, but it's extremely easy to support those that are unconnected in creating their own means of communication. And by connecting those, then, well, you have 50% of the people that will be connected using your technology. So I, I think there's a big collaboration there that can happen, and I'm happy to support that if you are interested in working on it. So if you are deploying your own infrastructure, then you have to know how infrastructure works. Uh, it has happened to me, I'm, I'm an, as a systems engineer and some of my pals in, univers in the university didn't know how a computer works or never opened a computer in their lives. So, but these people have to do it by themselves. So they started opening, the, like opening the box of the computer in this case, the box of the network. So part of the workshops that we facilitate are in relation to getting to know the infrastructure and how it works and what elements are involved in that process. Uh, so in this case, they were understanding how antennas work and the diagrams in the background show the, how the elements are interconnected to each other. Um, and of course, uh, so we try to we have a strong position in terms of gender and we try to influence that when we give the workshops and create uh, uh, equal opportunities for both men and women and non-binary groups. And uh, so in the workshops, it's usually quite diverse. Um, so this is, this is the, con the, the, the type of landscape that you can see in the communities. Hold on, I will try to... Uh, do this. Uh, no, not that. Sorry, my mistake. Hold on. Uh, there we go. Uh, so the landscape, no, not the clothes, but the landscape, like it's really, really mountainous. It's full of trees. It's very rural. In order to get there, uh, you have to, you, you, by car, it's five hours, and by bus, it's 12 hours from the nearby city. Uh, so the communities end up being in a in very rural, uh, are in very rural places where definitely the market is not going to get there. Um, and they learn from the very, very bare things. Like these are, they are learning how to do network cables and from network cables, how to interconnect two computers and then three computers and then any amount of computers through cables and then wireless links and how wireless links can help them get from point A to point B without cables. And from there, we talk about what computers can be used for when they are interconnected to each other. And we start uh, iterating on that, that idea. We do uh, uh, web, uh, web uh, authoring uh, little, small workshops using uh, LibreOffice to, web, to do web authoring. But then we talk about open source and the possibilities of open source. And then we jump back and forth in between uh, like these very bare, very hands-on activities and concept, concepts of, uh, of what things can be done with networks. Uh, the tricky part is that 
from our perspective, um, uh, the problem, the problem uh, in the current state of the internet is uh, they, are, they own the cables, they own the, the equipment, they own the wireless links, they own the computers. But then, when they, when you go to the, to the software that, the, to the uses of the network, you, you again have the centralization problem. Uh, they own infrastructure, but they don't own what happens on top of the infrastructure. So it's basically the road to the closest uh, service provider that is that has nothing to do with themselves. Uh, one of the one of the communities. Uh, hold on, let me see if I have that window. What you, that... you have a, a question in the chat from Jorah. Oh yeah, about, sorry. Um, what tech is used to make the network? Uh, what tech? So we okay. The so we start from the very bare bones. So they. Uh, start learning how a cable works, then how a switch a switch works, and how they can interconnect with each other. Uh, when we talk about uh, wireless networks, we use Libre Mesh and Libre Router. So that's technology that we have developed for for them. It's open source, uh, so it's LibreRouter.org and LibreMesh.org. The Libre Router is uh, an open source hardware for mesh community networks. And Libre Mesh is a geek free mesh networks operating system. Uh, so the idea is uh, apart, uh, setting aside the, the technical, so CJDNS, Batman Advance, BMX, Babel, all of these are routing, uh, dynamic routing protocols. Uh, and o OSPF, all, all these technologies are available for doing networks that can change over time. But all of that is a complexity that is far, far, far beyond the capacities of someone that has never had interaction with a computer. Uh, so LibreMesh, what, what it does is it turns networks a gig-free technology. The same way, I don't know if you have ever set it up uh, a TV dish on your roof when uh, broadcast television was a thing, uh, but it's basically you put your television, you run a cable from your house, from inside your house to the roof, and you set up a, an antenna on your roof. And the antenna, you turn it uh, and try to get uh, the best signal possible, the best image possible in your TV. Uh, we tried for the mesh networks, for the me mesh being wireless uh, networks that are interconnected. Uh, that where the devices are interconnected to each other by wireless links and they talk to each other in order for getting the message from one place to the next one. Uh, for, for that problem to be able to be solved in the same approach, like you set up, you, you plug it something in, in your house, you run a cable to your roof, and in your roof you put an antenna and you point it to the next neighbor. And that's everything that you need to understand at the beginning to be able to do the mesh. Uh, to do the network. Um, so I have a quick question, Nico. Um, yes. Are, is this experience, and I assume this is kind of your normal practice, which is kind of finding these, these communities who tend to be very off the, the beaten market path of kind of internet infrastructure and technology rollout and kind of working with them to like get their hands dirty with kind of setting up the underlying infrastructure. Um, are, do they tend to have familiarity with kind of, um, you know, either mobile phones or like other forms of like internet connectivity, which just are less available in their, their home communities? Or is this kind of really their first engagement with like using the internet and using, um, you know, computing technology of any form? So it's kind of all over the place. In most of the communities, you find something that I've like phones, like um, uh, Android phones, like cheap Android phones, have a very, very deep penetration. Even in in rural India, where there's no electricity, you find that families have at least one phone per family, and it's kind of the entertainment center for the community, for the family. Uh, so they do have penetration, but for example, in this community that I'm showing you, they, they all not only have a, a a wireless network, but also they have their own communi community cellular network. 
and uh, in the the elder the most elder members of the communities don't have the they are not literate so they don't know how to use a, a, a smartphone so they use feature phones uh, and this uh, and they can do it it's not a problem they learn how to use the phone in that way uh, like like a feature phone that is just the numbers and uh, anything n nothing else so they just remember a few numbers and they th type them in the phone and they can call each other without any problem uh, I, okay there's another photo of that later uh, or I think I have already done that photo okay uh, let me jump to another set of photos uh, so we don't uh, show you only one community uh, so this is in Janice again Tuxpan okay no not this one. Oh, for example in Honduras so uh, this um, so another thing that happens all the time in rural communities, in, the, in indigenous communities mainly, is that you find communal organization already there. Something that is required for community networks to work is a community ownership. So a community network is a, a network that is uh, owned, uh, maintained, expanded, and sustained by the community. So in order for that to happen, because no one else is there for, for them to be provided, uh, the community needs to be involved in and different communities have different approaches to ownership for example in this community uh, this is in Honduras uh, um, in this community the council is uh, com comprised of people from both genders in the previous community the council and the assembly is only comprised of the, people, the, the men that over 18 years old. In this community, all, all of them are part of, in equal parts. So you can see here, this is a, a community gathering where uh, we were discussing about the implications of bringing internet to the community. Uh, let, me, let me see if I have the photo. So in, you will see that in many of the communities we do tower climbing. And we try to do it in both with men and women. Uh, because towers are like you can connect with each other quite easily without towers but when you want to reach another community or when you want to reach the, the wider internet and and just an, an, another clarification for us internet from our description internet is an unconnected network of networks so it can be that some parts of the internet like from when you think when we think from the offline first community like terry was saying like it can happen that some of the nodes or how some of the hosts of the internet are disconnected at a certain point of time because you're going through a uh, through a uh, uh, like an, a, in, in a subway or something somewhere that you're not connected but also it can happen that a community that is part of the internet is disconnected from the wider internet well, still, that community is part of the internet, and that's why we discuss with them how, uh, if they want to be part of the internet, how to shape the internet in such a way that will represent them when they join the internet. And one of the things that we say is, uh, let me see if I find the photo here. So one of the workshops that we facilitated with them is about what was, like taking a snapshot of their community before the internet arrived and before they started doing the infrastructure. And you can see here, so they were, oh, hold on. What did I do? Uh, they were drawing uh, the, the things that they recognize as valuable about their community. What things are the key things that represent their community? Uh, the girls did a drawing, the guys did a list of things. It was interesting how they did different uh, approaches to, to describing their community but then we said what other things are part of this community that you haven't have not drawn what things are those that you don't want to see about your community and that's extremely important because in general we try we we describe things in a positive way and 
the things that we don't want to see are those that are magnified more. When, some, when internet that is a booster, internet that is something that speeds up things, uh, comes to our community. So we briefly mentioned like pornography and violence and uh, like they care a lot about families, so what will internet mean for the families? And not in this community, but in another community in Tuxpan in Mexico, one of the elders said that when the, uh, like 50 years, 60 years ago, when he was a kid, his, his grandma said, like, uh, they, we, are, we have been told that school, has, school is going to arrive to our community, and we were told that school is good. But, but then school came, and with school, kids started being apart from their parents. And by doing that, the local culture started dying. Then the, the road, we were told that the road was ca coming and that was good. And then the road came and with the road came uh, uh, supplies from some other places and we started eating differently. And, and then we started to, to have diabetes because we started drinking Coca-Cola and, and this was the first time in their whole life that they had Coca-Cola um, Coca and that they have diabetes in their communities. So now we are told that internet is coming and internet, we were told that it's good, but now these people come and say, okay, my internet might be good for some things, but not for some other. So what are we going to do with it? So uh, this, this is something that we need to reflect a lot about in, in relation to how we approach technologies and how, uh, because again, technologies are developed by people that are not there, them. So if we want to create a, a world that, that all worlds uh, fit in, uh, that is diverse and not normalized, uh, we want to plan that. We want to serve the communities that need technology in a way that allow them to be part of the design process of, uh, of um, the technology that they, they will end up using. Uh, and that that insight was awesome. Um, but I think we're also about at 20 minutes. So any, any oh. last thoughts? <laughs> oh, so many thoughts. <laughs> so that would be two communities of uh, nine that I wanted to share with you. But it, it's good that uh, uh, thank you for uh, opening this space. And maybe if you have more, if you want to dig more into this, we can plan a second iteration of it. Yeah. Uh, also, it would be uh, great if um, you have like a lot of video content that you've created as part of this, that um, if there's like any links you want to share with the, the group here for them to follow up more, uh, maybe just yes. paste it in the chat and I can make sure it's in our, our meeting notes as well. So I have, uh, I have been uploading quite a bunch now, late, lately. Uh, um, so if you go to, I will leave the URL there. Perfect. So uh, you can check them out and please let me know if you like them or what do you think about them. Absolutely, that's great, thank you. Um, the next item on our agenda was Terry giving a brief um, explanation of offline camp. Yeah, why don't you go to someone else first? I need to move myself. Can do. Um, I think Jonathan had to jump off a little bit early. So, Gerapo, do you want to talk about the project you've been working on? Uh, yes. So, um, actually, uh, so my project is uh, quite uh, uh, different. Um, so the problem I have is uh, we are in. I'm a, in a school and each end of week, uh, all computers are reset uh, for security reason. And so a computer can be reused by the next uh, students uh, the next week. And um, uh, the problem is each Monday we came to school and we lost uh, at least the first morning to just download all the apps we have to do uh, or coding or, or virtual machine to, to do our exercise. Um, and it's it's quite idiot because we are all downloading uh, the same file from Firefox or Microsoft for Visual Studio um, for people who use Visual Studio. And um, so my idea was to download all of this app um, from 
from an, an app store, where we will do peer-to-peer -peer from each uh, room to another, uh, or at least in one room. Um, and for that, I have uh, this thing. So um, I don't. Uh, currently, I'm writing the white paper. Uh, I don't forget a lot on it, but uh, yeah, I have some things. If you will to see it, maybe. Uh, and um, so the main idea uh, is to use uh, IPFS to share file because uh, in the past I will use uh, WebTorrent, but uh, IPFS performance ha performance have been increased, so there's no need of that. And so the idea is to use IP IPFS to share file and uh, to use uh, RPDB, RPDB to share an application list. So it works uh, simply. Uh, in uh, RBDB, you can share a list of JSON. And uh, in the list currently, you can have uh, one key, which is a writer key. And uh, this is a classic uh, key, uh, asymmetric key. And if you own the key, you can write in the database. So um, there is a first list. Uh, which is like, uh, which is for the repo maintainer. Um, this list has uh, as writer keys the maintainer itself. So only the maintainer can write uh, in this list. And in the first list, you have the list of uh, every uh, developers and um, the links to other uh, to other DB uh, or BDB database. Um, uh, which contain all information about apps, uh, version of apps. So the so first thing when uh, developers will actually uh, implement, act, uh, put an uh, application uh, in uh, this software, he has to come to a repo maintainer. The re uh, if the repo maintainer allow it to be in his repo, he had a developer, uh, developer item, which contain uh, the item about the developers, uh, how to contact it, uh, the website, and the bill. And also, uh, so, so the first thing, after you have that, you can have, um, uh, you can add application uh, with the, um, with the app approve of uh, the improvement of the repo maintainer. So the repo maintainer, so you, you put your app, um, you make a um, feed for your app, and the feed is linked to your main, uh, to in the, the link to your to your app feed is added in the main uh, um, repo feed, and the writer key is been uh, you set in the um, in your developers uh, in your developers uh, um, your developers. Uh, Approvement. Ah, I forgot. Uh, in the developer items, so only you, only the developers can write in the app feed, and the app feed contain uh, uh, an item per version, of per version, and for each item you have some information: the name of the version, the change log, uh, and the link to the binaries. And the link to the binary is is simply um, some. Um, uh, you have a link of different type of binaries: Windows, Mac, uh, Linux. Um, you, when you a uh, user want to download a, an app, so the, what was well, not for your, the user is simple. Uh, you choose an authority, uh, so a repo. It's the same, and um, your node will um, subscribe to all the database. So if you have, so you have all the information of, of all the application then you have a list of application with the search uh, i want to install uh, any, any apps and when you want to install apps the um, client will go to the database look for the binary link and uh, get the ipfs uh, file then just download the ipfs file this is an archive uh, so he just decompress the archive and execute uh, install a slash uh, script and that's all so the aim, my understanding is, the aim is that by kind of having this central list of, of all of the um, kind of files, when one user downloads this file within your network, um, yes. and a second user downloads uh, or wants to it download twice because it uses IPFS, so it will share between uh, both. 
Gotcha. And so do you open up a direct connection between those two nodes? No, no, actually, um, it, it, it really is IPFS. So um, for that, um, I, I don't <laughs> I don't have to care. In fact, uh, uh, I, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but IPFS use MTNS for local discovery, you know? So you're using over so over, it's over by that, and after the node is discovering, uh, they will share data between uh, both because uh, they we are uh, the fastest node. And so uh, this application, um, uh, the advantage of this application, there there is no server. But in fact, you maybe will need um, a server to constantly uh, pin the um, binary of uh, application, but um, that's uh, for the developers. So there is no uh, server. This is uh, resilient. So if a lot of person download the same apps, there is no uh, uh, ah, uh, there is no diminution of speed because there is no central server. It's like torrents. Um, that's all I have to say. <laughs> I don't know what to say more. Thank you for the description. I think I, I guess we have. Um, Dominic works on the Go IPFS team. Um, if you have any IPFS focused questions, Jim has also done a lot of prototyping um, and like building tools. Yeah, I know I have, a, I have get the answer to all of my questions, <laughs> thanks. Cool. Um, I don't know, Dominic or Jim, you have any um, advice or recommendations about how to um, kind of improve the, the spec or anything, but um, also, Connection point in case there's com competitions to have offline. Yeah, Dominic? Just to come uh, um, what do you I was, call it? So I come from not necessarily an education background, but I do not love remembering the times of us spending so much time ghosting the computers with Norton Ghost. It would take hours to do that. And I, I love seeing stuff like this because this is the exact thing I, I wish we had back then for the exact reason you mentioned of like, it's just a waste of student time to, student time and resources on the computer. So I, I love it, it's great. Awesome, cool. Well, thank you. And anyone who wants to follow up offline, feel free to. Terry, are you in a quieter place now to give your update? Vaguely? It's, well, you know, the noise is coming from less close. So it'll probably be at least less distracting. So. Uh, let me sh find my share screen button. So I mentioned in my introduction that I run an event called Offline Camp, which is a, essentially like a tech retreat in the woods in a lodge somewhere for 30, 35 people about the offline first movement, which I want to just be super clear that the event is not specifically about the decentralized web. It's about all of the problems that you encounter when you're up against crappy bandwidth. Um, but a lot of the people who come are interested in decentralized web as a solution to that. So I wanted to raise it here because it's a great place. If you would, instead of having an hour a month of conversations about this topic, would like to spend uh, three or four days solid surrounded by people who care about this stuff, this is the place for you. Um, so this is the website. This is last year's event still here. The event will be happening this summer. We have not launched yet, so I'm not going to reveal the exact dates and location, but if you want to make sure you're notified, you would click this join a future camp button, which would take you to this form. You can watch a video about the camp experience. Um, and when you fill out this form, it'll give you an opportunity both to give us your email so we can reach out and let you know when the camp's been announced, but also an opportunity to vote on where we go next. Our goal is that the event will circulate and go more to Europe if there are Europeans interested in coming so that people don't have to spend as much on travel. Um, we do also have scholarships available um, if that's helpful to anyone. And then if you want to get a sense of the kinds of topics we discuss at Offline Camp, the, the thing covers up, the Zoom thing is covering up where I need to click. Um, we have a Medium publication, uh, medium.com slash offline-camp, and you can see here, like, for example, there's a whole section on decentralized web, like the crossover between the decentralized web and offline first that you can check out. Usually what happens is we, um, we're having this sort of communal living experience. We break up into little groups to do these unconference discussions about whatever folks are interested in talking about around the theme of offline first. And then afterwards, we'll ask somebody who was at that discussion to write it up so that the broader community can take advantage of that. 
Um, you know, we also have the opportunity for people to do passion talks and stuff like that. But this event is all about just getting into really deep conversation with people who are excited about offline first and who might be coming at it in different ways than you are or exploring different problem sets. So it's really cool. We love to get a diverse audience. Um, so the best thing you can do right now, if you have any interest, is to just get yourself on this form so we can let you know when we announce the next event. And I'm saying this now because I suspect we will launch between now and the next iteration of this call. Um, and this is, we actually do an, an application process for the event to make sure that we have a chance to really explain to people the nature of this. You're in a lodge with other people. It's an interesting experience. Um, and make sure that we're really comfortable that everyone will adhere to our code of conduct and make sure that we have a diverse group. So um, you do want to at the top of the list of applications even though it's an application process so stay tuned for more on that does anyone have questions I can help with now See, yeah. so thank you so much Terry I'm definitely looking forward to that oh Nico, maybe did you have a question uh, yeah I was thinking on if it's uh, I understand it's offline first uh, and something that we have been talking with uh, Benedict Lau, also from the Decentralized Web uh, Summit uh, that Internet Archive is organizing, is trying to include more uh, spaces where non-coders can participate and bring their uh, point of view and their needs and opening those spaces. So do you think, Terry, that there's a space for that? And so how would you like to be discussing about that? So we welcome people who are not just coders there are some people who come who are more like business owners or product managers or stuff like that who are like interested in the use cases and the solutions you will like when i started attending i was not a coder yet and there certainly was you know there were conversations that went over my head but and as people are nominating their own topics for discussion some of them will be less super technical and some of them you'll know are like clearly somebody's going to get into how do we actually implement this thing in code um, but we would really appreciate that variety of perspectives to include people who aren't coders um, we get web developers we get ux people we get a few like business people product people etc i would say that at least half of the people are programmers but it doesn't you certainly don't need to be to come Okay, thank you. And I would like to continue that with you if you don't mind. Awesome. Thank you. All right. I think I'm the last person on our agenda. I just had kind of two quick two quick things to, to push forward to this group. Um, one is that there's a great write-up from um, I believe it's Vasco. Yeah, Vasco Santos, who's on the um, LibP2P team, talking about Bluetooth as a potential mobile transport. Um, he was specifically looking at web Bluetooth, which is kind of still a work in progress uh, from a um, usability, stability perspective, um, but a huge priority for kind of enabling a, a whole chunk of use cases that are, are pretty impactful for communities where, say, they have um, Android devices or you know mobile devices, but they may not have as good um, access to let's say uh, mobile networks or um, da data is very expensive or things like that is using some of the um, more like mobile device P2P options um, to say synchronize stuff between um, your computer and your phone or synchronize two phones with each other and share a file back and forth. Um, so that's that's an area that like adding adding a transport a mobile optimized transport to lib p2p would be hugely impactful in terms of um, expanding the possible use cases and and device options for um, kind of running ipfs there's already a number of groups who are running ipfs nodes on mobile um, i know that that's something that textile is actively doing um, Open Bazaar is having a, a mobile IPFS client. There's a, an Android client called Sweet IPFS, um, which is sweet um, and also small and then has only a subset of the node implemented, but um, kind of looking forward into the future, um, MDNS is a great option for when you have a lot of networked computers on the same um, network, but when you have kind of passing across um, networks and trying to do this kind of more optimistically, Finding, finding other options is great. So more comments, suggestions, thoughts on how to do this. 
Um, I think there's kind of a couple of paths forward here. Either um, we have other suggestions for different transports that we should look into other than Bluetooth, um, or we kind of push forward on having a Bluetooth spec and try and either get the P2P to do it, team to do it, or um, kind of raise it as a proposal for someone in the ecosystem to do. Nico, you have a hand. Yes, uh, so Dominic Tar, Dominic? Huh. No, it's not Dominic. Okay, yeah, uh, the Secure Scuttlebutt community has uh, many various open source mobile client and they have just implemented Bluetooth as a transport tool. So if you want to look into use cases or collaborate in the UX part, I think they are, it's a very quite, it's a quite open community too. Okay. Um, yeah, I know that we have some some connection points to Dominic, so definitely um, someone we could connect with. But call to action for anyone else to who's excited and interested to to jump in and um, help out add perspectives there. The other thing was just a, a quick note. Um, uh, someone from the Turing Institute reached out to me about kind of an offline first focus conference they're having about kind of connecting um, regions of the world that are maybe less connected right now. Um, it's mostly UK focused right now, like the, the community, but if anyone is interested in going, I have the contact information of one of the people who's organizing and is looking for more non-UK based um, contributors. So if anyone wants to um, kind of get get an intro and uh, be, be recommended as someone who might have a useful perspective either from kind of the um, kind of research perspective, the distributed network to support those communities perspective, um, or from kind of a like, how do we analyze and, and understand these networks so that we can improve and optimize over time. Um, the the network, they, they're very much coming from like a social good perspective, but also have like a lot of data analytics background. Um, so if anyone, feel free to ping me um, on GitHub or through email if anyone wants an intro and I can pass you along to one of the conference organizers. Cool. Well, we are out of time for today. Thank you all for the awesome demos and research reports and conversation. Um, let's keep it going. Um, I think probably we'll, we'll be doing some um, lightweight OKR mojo asynchronously in the repo. So if anyone has suggestions for what we should be focused on, um, there will be an issue there soon for people to, to add um, ideas or if there's any work that's happening throughout the Kind of ecosystem that we should be just keeping touch with and um, continuing to tie communication threads with and make sure that the work that gets done um, is motivated by these kind of offline connectivity use cases. Um, that's like another good area to continue that forward. Awesome. Well, wonderful. Thank you all so much for attending and I will see you next month for your monthly local offline community working group meeting. Cheers, everyone.